Hello, and welcome to episode 32 of A Book or Two to Review, Total Journey by David Ragg. The Royal Navy's War Against Axis Powers, 1939-45. to Starters, it's a nice sized book. But... Not exactly the thickest. And the thing is, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be a quick flick through, a read of World War II. And it is a very quick flick. But you have some gorgeous pictures. Mm. None I haven't. Honestly, seen in other books, but as a compilation, a, compil a compilation, it's lovely. And I have to admit, that is a picture which I've only ever found in one other book, and that's a very old book. So I'm very glad to see that. There are some gorgeous pictures in here. And that's always nice to have. So here are the chapter titles. Total Germany. Total Germany. A strong navy but thinly spread. The belligerent navies. The Royal Navy goes to war. Early losses and successes. The Norwegian campaign in Dunkirk. At war with an ally. United Judgment. Destroying Germany's capital ships. Battle Atlantic. War in the Mediterranean. Disaster and revenge in the Far East. Siege of Malta. Fighting the weather and the enemy in the Arctic. The submarine war. Changing ships and aircraft. The Invasion Fleet, Neptune and Overlord, Returning to the East, A Balanced Fleet. It's good. It's covering World War II from the Royal Navy's and to extent the Allied Navy's perspectives in two hundred and fifty nine pages. and finishes with a sentence for the first time in history the french marine nationale has more ships than the royal navy at present the royal navy has two of the largest aircraft carriers it has ever operated the queen of the prince of wales under construction but there are no plans to operate both ships and in any case, there are insufficient escort vessels for both to put to sea safely in a potentially hostile environment. Currently, they are operating bow ships. This is the problem when you write something, and I, I noticed in the, my own book chapter, uh, my own one, I haven't mentioned, I've updated the conclusion a bit, but that can be overtaken by events, and that's the problem when you write for current banks. And this is the point of normally I use, I'm reading a chapter from this book, and I will read some sections from this book for you. But I want to tell you why I think it's worth buying. And it's certainly not for its take on the modern stuff. 
because it's good, but it's the world changes so fast at the moment that it's this is pre the announcement of Type Forty Fives getting their upgrade with Ecto C Scepter, pre Type Eighty Three announcements, pre bit and all those sorts of things, pre. UAVs being operated from the aircraft carriers to test out and probably to help work out what they're going to be able to viable to operate from them in the future. All those things. And that's the problem of writing a book when you have to talk about modern affairs. Because things change so quickly. Which is why we tend to put historians and the pick history, but we're always asked for a view on current events, so we write. The thing about this book is it's good, it's short. Because that means it's written and readable at a frantic pace. And that is good because war is fast. World War II is fast. People think at six years, that's a long war. It goes in a second. It's one non-stop battering of things happening. Even when you think you're winning, even when we look back in time and go, we're winning at that time, the people in charge were getting battered and they didn't know if they were winning or not. World wars are like that. You have battles, literally, which involve millions of people on both sides. We talk about Midway, we talk about Toronto, we talk about Pearl Harbor, Matapan, all these operations, and we go, yes, we focus on those aren't ships just involved. There are hundreds more ships involved. There are operations going up on the north, south, there are the supply ships, there are this, that. There are, each of these operations are huge vastly complicated miracles that they come off. And they require so much work to do. It's non-stop. Now... Here is one of my favorite sections. Max ships and the birth of Dutch naval aviation. Intended as an interim measure, while the escort carriers made their appearance, the camp ships and Max ships were both merchant vessels rather than warships. While escort carriers were at first conversions from cargo ships and later built on merchant hulls, so that they could be converted to merchant ships after the war ended, they were always warships and commissioned into the United States Navy or Royal Navy. The camp ships were catapult armed merchant ships with a single Hawker Hur Sea Hurricane fighter that could be catapulted off when necessary. Most were manned by RAF pilots, as deck landing experience was not needed, although there were some fleet air pilots as well. The fighter could only be used as one, once, as it had to be ditched, and the pilot parachuted into the sea, hoping to be picked up by one of the convoy escorts. The big weakness was that, with an aircraft that could only be used once, convoy commodores were always reluctant to order the aircraft into the air, in case a greater need for it might occur later. The Max ships were merchant aircraft carriers. They were either oil tankers or grain carriers with a wooden flight deck laid over their cargo accommodation, and the bridge offset to one to starboard to provide an island. As with the camp ships, they were owned and operated by merchant shipping companies and manned by merchant seamen, while the main tenders and aircraft were air crew were naval personnel. The reason why these ships were chosen was that neither had deck hatches or to open to load or discharge their cargo. No fighters were carried as the ships were too small and the flight decks too short for such high performance aircraft. Even tankers were very much smaller at the time than is the case today. The tankers could carry three fairy swordfish for anti submarine patrols. While the Grand Carriers could only could carry four as the aft hold was used as a makeshift hangar, with the aircraft craned down so that maintenance could take place in the shelter. The Grain ships also had a shorter flight deck at 413 to 424 feet compared with the 460 of the fleet of the tankers, but the flight deck was always 62 feet wide. The first Mac ships did not appear until early 1943, by which time escort carriers were arriving in some, uh, some numbers from the United States, and the British had even convinced a few captured enemy ships before this. So, uh, such improvised ships could have been available from the early days of the war, but too few people in the Admiralty believed the concept would work, if aircraft expected to take off and land aboard ships with a 12 knot maximum speed. The Director of Naval Construction didn't help either. 
Expecting the design and development, uh, development to take a year, both the Admiralty and Ministry of War Transport also thought that operations over a flight deck above several thousand gallons of highly flammable fuel might be too risky. Okay. I can see why he's writing that, but there are other reasons going on. But as I said, he's going at a frantic pace. It was Sir James Lithgow, Director of Merchant Shipbuilding, who broke the impasse. Instead of taking a year to design ships, he sketched out a rough design on the back of the envelope. I have two ships are about to be built which can be converted without doing a jubilee, he claimed, adding with some perception. I'm prepared to do this, and provided I am not interfered with by the Admiralty. Wrong, he was interfered with in a nicest way, and if you think you're designing a ship just on the back of an envelope, no. There are so many people who complain that I can't know. The work on the converting the first two Mac ships started in June 1942, and by October, a further ten were being converted. The first two were the Empire Mac Alpine and Empire Mac Andron, but the plan to have a full 32 ships converted was scaled back to 19 as the more capable escort carriers began to arrive. Two naval escorts were assigned to Mac ships, numbers 836 and number 860, based at RNS Maiden, HMS Strike, near Londonary in Northern Ireland. Each Mac ship flight was assigned a live and letter suffix, and so that those of 836 were 836A, B, and so on. At one time, no, uh, no, number 836 had 92 aircraft, a record for a naval squadron, and beating even the 63 operated by number 700 NAS, which covered the seaplanes flown off battleships and cruisers. Unlike 700, which has an administrative convenience without a commanding officer, 836 had a commanding officer, Ransford Slater. But he still only held the rank of lieutenant commander, equivalent to a squadron leader in the RF or a major in the army. In the RF, he would almost certainly have been at least a wing commander, given the number of aircraft and the fact that each had a three-man crew. The smaller squadron, a uh, smaller squadron, number eight sixty, was manned by members of the Royal Netherlands Navy, who operated from two Dutch matchships, MV Akvus and Gathilda. Uh, from March nineteen forty-three until VE Day, Mac ships made three hundred twenty-three crossings of the North Atlantic, escorting two hundred seventeen convoys, of which just one was successfully attacked by U-boats. Swordfish made 4,177 patrols, an average of 13 per crossing. There is no record of a successful attack on the U-boat by a swordfish operating from a Mac ship, but no ship was lost while a convoy with a Mac ship present, and no Mac ship was sunk. With its experience of operating from Mac ships, the Royal Netherlands Navy introduced its own naval aviation, with the Royal Navy donating the escort carrier HMS Narania, which the Dutch renamed Karl Roman, after the Admiral who commanded the Abda. American, British, Dutch, and American Australian fleet cobbled together to face the Japanese, the British, and the German in the Battle of the Java Sea in 1942. Narania was one of the rare British escort carrier conversions, and slightly larger than average. Now, David, if you're watching this, which I doubt you are, it's well written. That's good. I disagree on the carriers, but that's my area of specialty, and it's mainly one of nuance and going back and looking at the various debates. And there's the fact is, it's not so much the Stanley Goodall as the third sea lord he has to deal with. Because under Henderson, there were plans for oil tankers, Royal Navy oil tankers, all sorts of things, to be converted to escort carriers. There are all sorts of things going on there. And then he has Fraser to deal with. And it takes him a while to get Fraser warmed up to the job. Because Fraser is far more conservative than Henson ever was. But, and sometimes, yeah, honestly, Goodall says all sorts of things to try and get people to one side. Sometimes he find, argues the other way to get them to do it. Um, and also, I would add that the, the lovely guy who comes up with a drawing based on the back of an envelope, that's wonderful. The sheer amount of sketches that the ANC has to produce for these things to turn into reality is a different matter. Everyone always claims it's easy in more time, and they always claim responsibility for the good ideas. A good idea seems to have many, many, many parents. A bad idea seems to stink and be an orphan. But it's a great book. It's worth reading. I could have picked a section I find less contention uh, uh, that I would be less... Mm, but I wanted I picked that section for a specific reason. Because this is the point of these books. The more you study naval history, and even if you go, especially if you go read David Rack's other more focused books, you'll probably go and then read this book and go, but, 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 but is that quite right? 
it is quite right in the speed and the words he's providing. He's providing an overview in this one of the toll war. You think of everything he's covered in a little over a page of this. The information he's provided. He's gone into the birth of the Dutch naval aviation. He has covered the Mac ships. He has talked about, explained how they were ordered, why they were, what they were like, why they were commissioned, all that, all that stats. All sorts of things. There are a dozen other names he could mention. David Rand, I think, has and could and has written a book on escort. I think it's David who's written a book on escort carriers. I'm not sure. That might be David Hobbs. It was Hobbs who wrote a book. There are so many historians called David. I do apologize. Dyslexic. I'm going to plead dyslexia. But entire book, which is actually bigger than this one, has been written on escort carriers alone. So, I'm going to give this book my wholehearted recommendation because it's excellent. Knowing that in a few months' time, when people have read this, they read this book, they're going to be commenting below saying, but it doesn't say this and doesn't mention this and doesn't go into this nuance and context, and you're always going on about nuance and context. I am. But some books are good because they give you the pace and the overview. This is a good and useful book because it gives you the whole war in something you can read in Most people probably read in a couple of days. I read it in a little over an afternoon, but I'm pretty much a professional speed reader. You have to become one when you have to mark 300 essays at the same time within a sort of a week. It's good. It's worth it. And you'll enjoy it. And that's the important thing. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed episode 32 of Book or Two to Review. This is the last one I'm going to record from this location. I'll probably be recording more from another location tomorrow night. Take care.